Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee, and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Handouts are right on that right on that uh, front, front uh, chair. Okay. I'm planning to give at least three, but perhaps four, conferences on the Psalms over the next four Wednesdays. Um, I'm, I appreciate being asked to do this. Joanne has been after me some time to do it, and I appreciate that she did. She did not relent in her efforts. Um, I've entitled the first of this series "Torah Piety." Torah Piety. From time to time, I will insist that the Psalms are to be prayed by Christians as Christian prayers. To try to get back to an original Hebrew text of, of the Psalter in the most original form is very much a nine-tenths conjecture. But when you've got it, you've created something way back there. And at, at best, at best, you'll be praying at the Psalms as the Jew does, which is, good. I'm not, no criticism of, of, no criticism of Jewish praying of the Psalms. But, but Jesus when he explains the scriptures to the apostles in Genesis and in, um, in Luke 24, Luke tells us specifically that he explains the Psalms. We read the Psalms as Christians. Now, one of the motifs you will find in the Psalms, or perhaps a, a major motif, a word that appears very high proportion, is the word Torah. There's a great deal about the love of the Torah. That's a Jewish term, which means teaching, literally it means teaching, but it's the name given to the law that was given on Mount Sinai, but it means more than that. It's everything that goes with the law. Think about how often in, in our worship we say things like, oh Lord, teach me thy, thy commandments. Give me the understanding of thy commandments. I've never been questioned about that. So everybody knows exactly what that means. Actually, I'm not sure I can make that presumption at all. But I, it, it's, it's a marvel to me that nobody said, how is it that you, can, you do not have, it's impossible to conceive, an Orthodox worship service where you don't ask God to clarify His commandments for us, or make us understand His commandments. Okay? The very first psalm will say that the blessed man meditates on the law, the Torah of the Lord, day and night, and finds his delight in the Torah of the Lord. Now, I want to show of hands here, how many of you can say that as you go through the various prescriptions of the book of Leviticus, that your heart swells with thanksgiving, and, and it, it, it comes off your, through your, if you say the words, it's like the sweetness of the honeycomb dripping all this. Is that your experience? Sometimes. Okay. Before I get into the, the few notes I've written down, like I haven't written very much, uh, let me tell you a, a story 
Those of you who have been around for a while have heard the story, but I haven't taught it for a very long time. I went to a cathedral in Basel in Switzerland. Back it was summer of 1966, my first, my first day in Basel, the first day in Switzerland, second day in Switzerland. Around the door of, of, the, uh, of, this, of this ancient cathedral is, are little bas-reliefs, a frieze, a little bas-relief of little scenes from the life of St. Martin of Tours by Sulpicius Severus. Those of you who have read that work will remember, and those of you who have not should, the story of St. Martin as a soldier in the Roman army. He's riding along in Gaul, a member of the legion, and he sees some poor beggar standing there without any adequate clothing. He's there bare barefoot and he's in the wind and it's winter and it's cold and he doesn't have anything to cover himself with. Martin is wearing the long Roman cape, oh, the winter cape. It's heavy. Martin takes his sword and cuts off half of the cape and puts it over the shoulders of this poor naked beggar. That's one of the scenes in this life of St. Martin of Tours that's portrayed in this, this bas-relief, this very thin, very, very, uh, not, it's not deep, it's, it's just, just little, little frames. But when you notice that is that the, that particular scene has, make sure, make sure Aziza gets a copy well, there were, uh, I made 20 copies, okay. Are we already out of copies? Uh, I'm astounded. Oh, uh, there they are, okay. I didn't, I didn't think I had more than 20 students. <laughs> that scene has been damaged by a mallet and smashed by one of the reformers, one of the Swiss reformers, that is a disciple of Calvin, because the scene portrays what this vandal considered to be works righteousness. You see, the way Luther set up his approach to the scriptures, everything is divided between Torah and the gospel. Torah is obligation and the purpose of the, of the Torah is to prove to you that you can't keep it. <laughs> Therefore, you must fling yourself on the mercy of God because you can't keep his commandments. I have actually, a long time ago, I've actually run into a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount by somebody who had that deep inside him, who believed that the Sermon on the Mount is simply a bunch of rules that Jesus gave us to prove to us we couldn't keep them. In other words, Jesus did not expect us to turn the other cheek. Jesus did not expect us to go the extra mile. Jesus did not expect us to return good for evil. We're going to, we, the, so the teaching of Jesus is to get us so discouraged that we'll fling ourselves on his mercy. Now, I have to tell you, I believe that's a distortion of the text, nor do I think any of the, of the reformers of the 16th century would agree with such, a, such interpretation. 
But if we're going to read the Psalms as Christians, we have to read, read all those passages about the Torah as pertaining to the larger Torah, the Torah of Christ himself. Right away in the very first Psalm, we're going to be given the choice between two ways. Okay. The word for way in, uh, in Hebrew, by the way, is derek. Come right ahead. Just make sure you pick up a, a, uh, some handouts. And you can, you can come on. You don't need to gather down that end. You can come, come on down here. These are all the goats over here. You want to be over with the sheep. All right. Yes, you you come you righteous of my father, yes. <laughs> We're presented in the very first psalm with two ways. The way of the wicked and the way of the righteous. The Hebrew word for way is derek, D E R E K, derek. The Greek is hodos. H-O-D-O-S, as in odometer, where you, where you measure the way. Hodos, or Derek. Jesus presents us in the Gospel of Matthew with two ways. Behold, I, he, and, and he tells us to take the narrow way that leads to life. That's the same thing you have in Psalm 1. The narrow way that leads to life. The way of the wicked leads to perdition. He tells us to, the other metaphor he uses is the gate. Take the narrow gate. Don't take the wide gate. Everybody's trying to get through that gate because it's, it's the way to perdition. What we have in the, in the Gospel of Matthew is an unapologetic presentation of the Christian life as a life of disciplined learning and learning based on the commandments, observance of the commandments. All those prayers we say in the Orthodox Church, teach me thy, thy commandments, give me understanding of thy precepts. Oh, but we, over every service we, we have the prayer. That is so consonant with the Gospel of Matthew. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus sends out the apostles to make nations, to make all the nations into mathetai, into disciples, learners. Okay? Teaching them to do what? Observe. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So the Christian life is a following of commandments. Now, that, that accent is very distinctly different from the accent of Western, Western Christianity after the 16th century. The, the Christian life is a way of observance. Some years ago, I was asked to give a retreat at the beginning of Lent at Calvin Presbyterian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. This is many years ago. So I began the retreat by reading them that section of Calvin's Institutes, which they were, they were completely unfamiliar with Calvin's Institutes. <laughs> I read them the section of Calvin's Institutes where he decries this whole custom of Lent, where people are trying to earn their salvation by praying and fasting and giving alms. He, Calvin did not approve of Lent at all, and I'd read them this passage, and of course these Calvinists are completely dumbstruck. Because uh, the, the, I'm not a Calvinist, but I, I'm just, but I did that as sort of a... Was I just being nasty? <laughs> it's, it's possible I'm just being nasty. <laughs> but, but these were lovely people. These were lovely people. And uh, I don't remember what I talked about, but I remember starting the Lenten retreat by, by pointing, reading what Calvin thought of Lent. Let me tell you how I 
regard the Christian praying of the Psalms. Let me take you to the Grand Canyon. I'll take you to the Grand Canyon. Or if you don't know the Grand Canyon and you have some other place you want to go, that's perfectly okay. I don't care where you go. I'm going to the Grand Canyon. Early in the morning, the sun rises to the east of the Grand Canyon. And as it rises and sheds its light, the Grand Canyon comes alive. Things start to move. The colors change. There's a book by a person by the name of Murdoch, D.M. Murdoch, which you can't get anymore except, I think, on, on uh, Kindle, called Jesus as the Sun Throughout History. Jesus as the Sun Throughout History. This sun throws light on the earth. By reason of this sun, who is Christ our Lord, the earth looks different. Things are differently configured. Shadows are cast which were not there before. And the sun lights up things we had not discerned. You see, as the sun throws light on the earth, we perceive things on the earth. Things in our earthly existence that we would not otherwise see, or in ways we would not otherwise see. The mind becomes adjusted to the taste of truth. That's not a bad line now to think about it. I could use that line to touch on sometime. (laughs) The, The mind becomes adjusted to the taste of truth. I probably read that somewhere. Probably Jim Kushner wrote that someplace. And I... Now, what the sun gives us, by going over these things, what the sun gives us is a narrative. The sun gives us a story because there is movement. Eva, come over here, dear, and sit over here because Nancy is is, is languishing away from loneliness over here. All these other people are avoiding her. So as the sun goes over, there's movement. The sun itself moves. A a story is formed. I wrote it, I published, I wrote, I crafted an article in Touchstone many years ago on, on this subject. Of, of, of two revelations. And uh, it was in, well, I think, an edition we put out on creation. Is there a story in the world? Is, it, is there grammar built into the, into, the, into the structure of things? Now, what is true of the earth as Christ our, Christ our Son rises over it, what's true of the earth is preeminently true of the Scriptures. The shift of shadows and shapes. Gradually, we preserve a movement. The the picture alters as details become visible and contoured. This is what Christ does for the scriptures. We see prophecy fulfilled. We see law fulfilled. We see everything in the scriptures fulfilled. Now, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of my notes because given the way I've started this lecture, they're extraneous and no longer pertinent. Let me, however, consult my my timepiece because I'm supposed to give you time to ask questions at the end.
Okay. This afternoon, I sat down and translated two psalms for you. <laughs> and you have them there. And just, this is, these are just working, working copies. I have no intention of publishing these. I had the Hebrew text, the Greek text, the Latin text, and several, several English translations there, and just sort of put together something that I, let me say that it, it, took, me, it took me about an hour and a half to do Psalm 18, and about 20 minutes to do Psalm 1, and they were superior, these translations are superior to anything I've ever seen, <laughs> which tells me how bad the translations of the Psalms are. <laughs> okay. However, let me quickly, let me quickly say, Do not change the way you pray the Psalms if you're accustomed to praying them that way. Particularly if you've started a commitment to memory that way. Just stick with it. Unless it's heretical, which includes most of the translations in the 20th century. <laughs> okay. But you, 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 you don't need to worry about, see, the, uh, the, the, if you say the, 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 uh, the Orthodox Study Bible, you don't need to worry about that. Um, it's, that's not even a translation from the, from the it's not a translation at all. It's simply an adjustment of the King James, of the King, King James Bible, of the New King James Bible, just an adjustment. I was the one asked to, to translate the Psalms, the Orthodox Study Bible, and I, after I turned in a, a few, Peter, Peter Gilchrist asked me, to, as soon as I turned in a few of them, they said, this is unacceptable, this is, this is unacceptable. You're actually translating them. We don't want this. I was translating, I went to the Greek text, because the Septuagint text, and I was translating them, and, I've taken a great deal of care because I've, I had ideas in my mind that for the next thousand years, the Orthodox Church would be using my translation of the, well, the Lord had different ideas. <laughs> uh, and I, so they rejected my translation, and they appointed three other people to, to, to whip something together, but that's what they did, is simply whip it together. Let me read for you Psalm 18. It's 18 in the Greek Bible, 19 in the Hebrew. Oh yes, if you, if, you, if you already have a way of praying the Psalms and it suits you, don't change just because I say so. I'm not here to interfere with your prayer. Anybody who deliberately changes the words of prayers will have to take what he gets the people of God will not be happy with him. All right. I did the best I could in a short time, but don't publish this, please. <laughs> the heavens recount the glory of God. The heavens, Hashemayim, Hashemayim. That word appears already in Genesis, doesn't it? Hashemayim. Misafim. Safer, the verb safer, literally means, starts to mean to count. But it starts by extension, it starts to, is to give an account. Okay, safer. Therefore, to recite. A sofer is someone who recites. Mm -hmm. I had a parishioner many years ago named David Sapper. I explained to him the meaning of his, I explained to me also he was Jewish, which he did not know. <laughs> the heavens recount the glory of God, the Kabod Adonai, the heavens recount the glory of God, and the firmament, ha Harakia. Remember the, remember the firmament is created on the second day. The heavens are created on the first day, the firmament on the second day. The firmament is that vault, the rounded vault over the earth. The heavens recount the glory of God, and the firmament declares the work of his hands. Day unto day expresses the message, and night unto night conveys understanding. There is neither speech nor words, and their voice is not heard. Voice there is whole, 
very important word in the Psalter, Chol Adonai, think of Psalm 28 or 29 in Hebrew, the voice of the Lord seven times in that Psalm, seven times, Chol Adonai upon the waters. There's, there's neither speech nor words, and their voice is not heard. And then the next line contradicts it. Through all the earth their voice goes out, and the words to the edge of the world. In them he placed a tent for the sun. Okay. See this vault. It's a tent over the earth. In Jewish ritual, where is the tent used? Well, in some ways, in Sukkoth. Sukkoth. Anything else? Marriage. marriage. The marriage tent. That's what it becomes. The marriage tent. Okay. There is no spe neither speech nor words. Their voice is not heard. Through all the earth their voice goes out, and the words to the edge of the world. In them he placed a tent for the sun, coming forth like a, like a groom from his canopy. He rejoices like a giant to run his course. He leaves from the border of heavens, of heaven, going round to the other end. There is no hiding from his heat. And there's the first part of the three-part psalm. The heavens declaring the glory of God. Notice that in this psalm, unlike Psalm 8, the sky is investigated in daytime. In Psalm 8, it's at night, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. Psalm, Psalm 9 talk, talks about the moon and the stars. Now, the second half of the psalm, for someone who's just beginning the Psalter, will, see, will seem incongruous. Because the second half of the psalm, second part of the psalm, second third of the psalm, is about the law. It's about the Torah. That's why I started with the sun rising over the Grand Canyon, or over the Alps, or over probably the most glorious sight on all the earth, that's the Canadian Rockies. The Canadian Rockies have got it over any mountains on the face of the earth. I've, I've crossed over the Alps by plane I don't know how many times, it takes about 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. In the, Canadi the Canadian Rockies, it's hour after hour of these mountains coming up to try to hit the, hit the, hit the plane. <laughs> hour after hour. So now the, the attention shifts from the sun to what the sun illuminates. The sun illuminates God's Torah. Give me understanding of thy commandments. We pray that over and over again. Give me understanding of thy commandments. The law, the law of the Lord, Torah Adonai. This is the same Torah you're going to see in Psalm 1. But the just man meditates on the law of the Lord, the Torah Adonai. The law of the Lord is perfect, tamim, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is faithful, making the simple one wise. The precepts of the Lord are upright, giving joy to the heart. The command of the Lord is unblemished, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is holy, enduring forever and ever. By the way, I'm, I'm not I'm not sticking to one version here. At, at this part, the fear of the Lord is holy. I shifted from the Hebrew to the Greek because <laughs> I, I prefer, that's the way we we the Christians Christians have always prayed the Psalms according to the Greek text, always have until the 20th century. Keep that in mind. Until the 20th century, all Christians prayed the Psalms according to the Greek text. <laughs> the uh, you're going to say, well, what about the King James Version? That's, 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 that, that was made from Hebrew. That's correct. But in the authorized version, in the introduction to the authorized version, 
The Parliament explicitly says this translation of the Psalms is not to be used in church. <laughs> You're supposed to use the one that's in the Book of Common Prayer, which is based on the Greek text. It's the Coverdale Psalter. Roman Catholics always used a translation of the Psalms called uh, the Gallican Psalter, which is translated uh, from Greek into, into, into Latin. That's the one I pray every day, is the Gallican Psalter, from Greek into Latin. St. Jerome made a translation of the Psalms from Hebrew into Latin, and it almost perished for lack of copyists. People wouldn't copy it. Why? They were already, they've been praying that Psalms in this version for, for centuries. They're not going to just, thought well, Jerome comes along with something better. They're not going to. If same, same, for, same for Parliament. England had a hard time keeping peace between Catholics and Protestants anyway. They didn't want to, they didn't want to change the way people were praying. The book, the book of Common Prayer was good enough for Grandpa. It's, it's good, you know. Let me go back to this. I, I, anyway, when I came to this part about the fear of the Lord is holy. Enduring forever. Timor Domini Sanctus, permanence and saculum saculi, the fear of the Lord. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More desirable than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the oozing honeycomb. There's your second, second part. It's all these glories of the law, the testimony of the Lord. You see why the law of God is something to, to be delighted in. Mm. We're supposed to taste it. Mm. By the way, the way and the pace in which I'm reading this psalm is the way it should be read in church. Uh, fortunately, I had the two best readers in front of me for reading the psalms. I had the two best. If you want to see, hear how the Psalms are supposed to be read, listen to Aziza or listen to, or listen to Eva. Everybody, I mean, everybody else reads the Psalms too fast, way too fast. Uh, sometimes they're just... However, this parish is infinitely better than other places I've been. I've even, on our worst day, we're not as bad as, as uh, Trinity Cathedral down on, down on Levitt. I mean, that just, it's... it's it sounds like a dentist drill. Uh, well, they finish, they finish nine psalms in 15 minutes when they do, the, when they do the, the hours before. Nine psalms in 15 minutes. It's like a dentist drill. In fact, I walked over to hear what I thought they were doing in some foreign language. It's sort of, I did not recognize English. So read the psalms, not too slow, but read them as poetry. Just read them as poetry, which means sort of get the pace of them. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I, when I translated these this afternoon, and you're looking at this, these translations, you're looking at just a very short time. Uh, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I did them all this afternoon. Uh, I tried to observe some sort of cadence when I could. Okay. Thy servant also observes them. Okay, what? What is that? The law, the commandments, the observing. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Jesus says that it's in the Great Commission, an essential part of the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. By the way, you might want to accent the pronoun. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Mm -hmm. Which brings in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, but I say... Jesus contrasts his Torah with the Torah of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Thy servant also observes them. In their observance is a great reward. But then he has feelings of modesty. But who can detect unwitting failures? <coughs> who can detect unwitting failures? Preserve me from hidden sins. From willful thoughts, safeguard thy servant. Let them not rule over me. For then I shall be blameless and free from great offenses. May the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my rock, O Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. The meditations of my heart. Remember Psalm 1? The just man meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. He finds his delight in the law of the Lord. Any questions uh, so far? Okay. All right. Let's take Psalm 1. Now, Psalm 1 is the key to the Psalter. It's the key to the Psalter. It's not just the first Psalm. It's a Psalm that unlocks all the other Psalms. Psalm 1 has a presentation of two ways. The Derek Rashaim, the way of the wicked, and the way of the righteous. The Hebrew text says, the blessings of the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. I didn't translate this from Hebrew. This line I translated from Greek. <laughs> makarios, makarios. In, 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 in Hebrew, it's ashrei ha'ish. Asher ho'lohalak. Blessed is the man who walketh not. Blessed is the man that wanders not. That's preserved in the, in the, uh, in the Gallican Psalter. Abiit, wanders, strays. Strays, not just walk, but strays. I put, I put wanders instead of strays. Why? I already get two syllables there. That's all. <laughs> Blessed is the man that wanders not in the counsel of the wicked. Wanders also goes with wicked. Hmm. Nor takes a stand in the path. That's the way I translated Derek. Derek means a path, a way, a street. I remember uh, walking through the streets of Tel Aviv. And uh, in the street signs, you have the name Derek <laughs> over and over again. Just in Greece, you have Hod, which is the same as our S2 street. Blessed is the man that wandereth not, wanders not, in the counsel of the wicked, nor takes a, takes a stand in the path of sinners, nor sits in the company of scorners. He shall be like a tree planted beside the streams of water, which brings forth its fruit in its season, as leaves do not wilt. And whatever he does shall prosper. Not so the wicked, not so. Like a shaft that the wind blows away, the wicked shall not stand up in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for well, the Lord knows the way, the Derek, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. There are your two, there are your two ways. Um, I'm supposed to give you some time at the end, and we were, we're coming up on about 20 of, I think. You've got six minutes to ask me questions. Um, you mentioned in Psalm 1 of the verse that on his law he meditates uh, day and night. Mm -hmm. That's from Psalm 1. But I, is that later in the Psalm? Did I, did I skip that? I, I just don't see it. Oh, then I skipped it. <laughs> I, that's okay. And when, you, when you do something, you translate a Psalm in 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it, 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 his, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. I just, I just neglected to type that in. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jim. Nancy, when, when you post these, I will give you these texts. Oh, so, well, okay. You can, I will, it's okay to post them. Oh, yes. Oh, I thought you pointed me a few minutes ago and said, don't publish these. <laughs> You're fine, whatever you'd like. I wasn't even pointing at you, I was pointing at Aziza. <laughs> I thought you, 
I thought you thought I was over there. No, no, no. I was pointing at Aziza. See, I have this. I have this feeling that sometime I'm going to sneeze and Aziza is going to publish it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's Eva. Um, in Psalm 18, you remark about the change from seeing what what the world does. Um, what God did in nature, and then reflecting on the law. Mm -hmm. And I, I've always just taken it as the law of God in one realm and the law of God in another. Yeah. Is, is Actually, I, I put, that was the burden of my article that I published in Touchstone. There are two revelations. <laughs> okay. the, the, the one in nature is also written down. As I've heard Jim say on a number of occasions, that the that the amount of memory in a cell rivals Library of Congress. <laughs> I think you're right too. You know, there's just there's an enormous amount of information in in, in the universe. Um, I, but that that was the burden of, my, of, of the article that I wrote. Yeah. There's also there's also a section, by the way, in, in my little commentary on Genesis, that's entitled "The Heavens Declare." Or I say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, Jim, thank you for pointing out that I, that I skipped a line. When I, I, was trying, I was just more curious where. Yeah, it comes, it comes after his delight is in the law of the Lord. And the next line is that I skipped. It's, in his law. Yeah, I don't see that line. Did I miss that too? Yeah. I don't know if it, the psalm ended with that. I should know because no. I should have memorized the psalm. Right <laughs> I oh, I've I memorized the psalm. Beatus vir qui non abit in concilium piorum in via peccatorum non stated. I don't know the Psalms in English, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm sorry, dear? It's after the scorners. Oh, okay. After the scorners, yes. The sea, of the sea of the scorners, yes. The scorners are the worst, by the way. The, uh, if you go through the book of Proverbs, the worst kind of person is the scorner. He's more, he's more than a fool. The fool is just a fool. But, and, but the scorner is one who absolutely hates uh, the truth. Yeah. Yes, yes, Nancy. Um, as I've tried to do more praying of the Psalms on a daily basis, I can't seem to find a, a plan and so I find that I, at, at one point I say, you know what, I'm just going to keep a marker and go to the next psalm and the next psalm, and then other times I use other plans. Do you have any general advice? Depends on what you want to do. How, 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 how long do you want to take to get through the Psalter? I don't think it's necessary to pray all the psalms, by the way. If you've, if you've only got a limited amount of time, I'd pick, 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 pick the psalms that most attract you. But what, what you want to do, though, is make the psalms like yeast in the leaven of the heart. You, you want to massage those psalms down into the heart. That's why just going through the psalm of Wade Duke, for example, and the, and the Daily Devotional Guide, the same James Daily Devotional Guide. <laughs> I would never pray the psalms that way. Um, the, uh, but but since, since boyhood... My discipline was determined by the monastery itself that I joined when I was still, still very quite young. Well, we did, we did the whole book of Psalms every week. But that is a lot for a person with a busy schedule and things. That's a lot. And I don't, I don't encourage, I simply don't encourage people to try that right off. Uh, when I was, back when I was a busy parish priest, <laughs> That is to say, before I came here, because here coming here was was a source of it was I wasn't busy here at all, but uh, but while I, well, back when I was a busy parish priest and traveling all over the place, I chanted the psalms in the eight tones, and I had a, always the same tone with the same song, and I still chant the psalms in, in the tones in when I take a shower on those rare occasions when I when I get in the shower I uh, I, I chant the psalms. <laughs> Um, but I wouldn't worry about that, Nancy. 
getting through. But if you want to pray them through over a period of time, that's perfectly okay. I'm not going to impose my way of praying on or, or anybody else because I know how weak and unsatisfactory my own prayer is. But, but I would say that the, the way we do it in the, in the St. James Daily Devotional Guide, I think we finish them every six weeks. I think, I think that's it. Perhaps seven. It, it used to be seven anyway, but when we, when we did the Book of Common Prayer. Yeah. Now we use the, 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 the revised Book of Common Prayer that's used by the Anglican Church in North America. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the Episcopalian Book of Common Prayer skips a lot of the Psalms. They skip, skip, skip them, and they skip. They start, skips up Romans, for example. Skip you know, you know, They don't want to don't cramp anybody's style. But the, you won't. The, the Anglican Church in North America, they don't do that. They, you, you, you get them. But the, uh, the the tradition of the Book of Common Prayer. There are two different two different sets of ways of doing it. One is to to get through the the Psalter once a month, and something I think the other is. The, Get but there's two different two different programs in, in the tradition of the book, beginning in 1549. There's, there's two different programs of the Book of Common Prayer. It's quarter of, and I'm supposed to let you go at quarter of, but I will be I would be glad to hear another question or two if they have them. Okay. Now, someone introduces the conflict between the righteous man and the unrighteous, two ways, okay? In Psalm 2, the righteous man becomes the Messiah, and the unrighteous become rebellious. Quarry from where gentes, et populi meditatis utinania, why do the nations rage? And the pe people meditate on something empty. They're meditating too, meditating on something empty. That's going to be the title of the next Touchstone Conference, I believe, isn't it, Jim? Why do the nations rage? Uh, sometime, say something about that, how much you love that psalm. Say that to, to, uh, to Doug Johnson. That's his favorite psalm. <laughs> He'll be much gratified if you do. Okay. Glory to the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit, now and ever, the God who is, who was, and is to come at the end of time. Amen.